fossil day. Hey, I'm almost a fossil. You know what? When I think of uh, fossils, we got about a minute. When I think about fossils, I um, sometimes wonder where everybody else is because <laughs> fossils are very rare. Uh, the circumstances to create fossils are very rare, and yet we have a lot of them. National Geographic magazine. I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not advertising it. I just I like it. It has a great article on uh, what we know about dinosaurs the, uh, these days, and they're very different from when I was young. And it's because we're filling in the fossil record quite well. Okay, it's time to start. Uh, if you're new to, let's see, I haven't looked through the names, but we've got a pretty good crowd today. And um, first thing I'd like to do is say, welcome to the Science Circle. And if you're new, uh, we try to go for about an hour. Um, now, that said, please feel free to ask questions, comments, all that stuff like that. Just like in class, I hate to just talk to myself. So uh, welcome, and I'd like to uh, talk to you today about uh, some of the exciting uh, technologies that uh, will help to change your future. And so let's uh, go on, uh, or let's start. Is um, I've entitled my uh, presentation today, Emerging Technologies, the Future is Here. And yeah, it's over there too. <laughs> and in, in front of you. And since our presentations kind of have focused on uh, science and not technology, I'd like to uh, provide a bit of background about what technology is, uh, particularly emerging technology. I have eight exciting technologies to share with you, and you've likely heard of them because that's one of the characteristics of um, emerging technologies. It's just that you may not be as acquainted with them as people who actually work in the field. Um, nonetheless, uh, they'll probably all impact you, so it's wise to learn about them now. Okay, so let's take a look at what um, I plan to uh, share with you today. Um, first, like I said, I'll give you a little bit of background, what tech is, what, what kind of tech we've had in the past, uh, emerging tech, and at the end, some conclusions, and I'd very much like to know what you think along the way, okay? So a little bit of background. Um, the first thing is, what is technology? Well, I've kind of defined it loosely as anything you have that you weren't born with. <laughs> and that would mean anything from um, fire to pens to, um, yeah, OK, to, 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 you know, to, to what brings us here today. Uh, well. <laughs> Okay, I know there's always uh, definitions are always, you have to define them a little bit more than just that, right? Okay, uh, so yeah, um, no, but maybe maybe what, what cuts your beard, if you cut your beard, certainly is part of it, but that's just a loose definition. In other words, the idea, it's not just computers. You're winning charming personality. Well, is that, <laughs> I won't ask how you got it, maybe technology. Okay, so why do we use it? It's software, or, or wetware, as they call it in, in computers. In other words, when you talk about people, it's wetware, and then software is things you write, and blah, blah, blah. Okay, so why do we use technology? Well, it helps us to do things we normally do, uh, only better and easier, and some things we can't. In other words, I can't see the microscopic world. We can now see down to atoms. We can see billions of... Uh, in other words, we can enhance our... Um, senses that we already have, and we can do things that uh, we would like to do uh, if um, better, okay? So that's kind of, these. here again, these are all kind of loose ideas. If you have a slightly different way of looking at it, please. So emerging technology is that basically it's tech that you uh, may have heard of, but you don't have it yet. You can't just um, order it online, okay? Um, whoops. Okie dokie. So, technology is part of STEM or STEAM. Uh, now, I don't know how universal that is, so I've decided to spell it out here, essentially, uh, to put it in perspective. But we've been studying, uh, most of the presentations are on science, 
that is study the physical world. Now, what I mean by physical world is stuff that you can sense and measure and stuff, not things that are in your uh, head. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, your life would be incredibly different. That's that's right. We're so bound up in technologies and stuff, we we tend to think of them as almost an extender of ourselves. So. Technology is the physical application of science. We'll be talking about a bit about it. Yes, uh, actually, 5G is one of the is the very first one that we'll be talking about. Okay, um, engineering is how to create the technologies. Uh, art is, in other words, a lot of uh, technologists uh, like to make things look nice and have aesthetic qualities to them instead of just uh, functional. And math, of course, is a precise language uh, for the whole thing, uh, language of uh, relationships. Okay, so let's take a look then. Now, whether you believe it or not, uh, when you use technology, you're basically saying, I trust science. I trust in science. Um, you can't use gas or electricity or whatever without saying, I trust in chemistry. You, if the reason that you probably are, don't have a lot of diseases uh, is because, or infections, uh, remember that, of course, life expectancy, now that's average life expectancy, um, was very low even 100 years ago, and it's still low in, uh, in many places uh, because they may not have uh, quite the access to medicine and stuff. But basically, you don't have measles, mumps, flu, polio, smallpox, whatever, because enough people use vaccines and we have medicine. Uh, you trust your life every time you fly or drive, um, and you trust um, computers to communicate and do almost everything. We, we just mentioned that. Well, and that's the irony, of course, tagline, <laughs> is they use that and then <laughs> they are actually saying, I'm trusting in this to be able to get my word out. Okay, now, there's, a, there's about four little videos. They're very small, between, say, two and a half to three minutes. And yeah, well, but the problem with that syzygy is that for anyone that makes those type of arguments, you can't reason with them because it's not a rational argument. That's one of the things I've had to learn is, yeah, down the Abbey. Okay, so every technology has been new. So what I would like you to do, and I'll do it too, is it's now seven minutes after, this is about three minutes and 30. So what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to go there and I'll be back in about three minutes and 30 seconds. In other words, go there, take a look at it and look for why and reactions and social issues, okay? I'll be back in about three minutes and 30 seconds.
Okay, hope everybody's had um, enough time to, yeah, it's, it's, it's very interesting, is hope everybody's had enough time to take a look at that. Um, let's see, just hook up the bugging or covertly, well, cry of a banshee. Absolutely, we're going to talk about that here in just a second. In fact, the first thing that I would ask is why did they want to have a telephone? In other words, uh, let's see, my slide's starting to clear in there. Okay, so why? Well, why would you want to have a, a telephone? The other thing is while you're uh, kind of writing a couple things there um, about why you'd want to have a telephone, although I actually put the answer, unfortunately. Well, but what about communications face-to-face? -face? Um, in other words, why, why a telephone? Now, uh, while they needed, long, they needed operators for long distance for quite a while, you're right, and um, there was a five, in the United States, there was a five to call the housekeeper in London, right. Actually, the very first, of course, this is now, you're now treading on my theory. <laughs> this is, this is uh, my, uh, my uh, prior expertise. But the first phone lines in the United States were between rich people and their, de and their doctors in uh, Connecticut, first phone book. Um, and so there were limited uh, uh, connections at the very beginning, the same way as perhaps there's limited places for electric cars to uh, refuel, all these sorts of things like that. Um, yeah, so there's lots of reasons for it. And the idea is rather than to be there in person, it would be like, think of what, think of how difficult it would be is if you had to travel somewhere in the world to attend these uh, presentations. Obviously, that would be prohibitive. Um, so the other part of it, though, is what, uh, before I put it up there, what kind of reaction did people have to the telephone? This one, one reaction that you heard. And one of them was like, cry of a banshee. <laughs> yeah, besides the, in other words, um, reactions. Talk loudly, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, not too many of my friends. Uh, who needs it? All that kind of stuff. Like, so I, this is this is kind of what I saw. Is one, it's not a toy. Uh, of course, this is kind of generational differences. In other words, if you actually look at a kid and give them a piece of technology, they'll be right at home with it. They'll just start playing with it, and you know, whatever. An adult goes, "No, don't break it. Don't hurt it." <laughs> uh, self consciousness. Um, yeah, uh, that sort of thing. Okay, first class difference. In other words. Uh, that the head butler was the one that's, you know, that kind of stuff. I was actually told when I first joined, uh, well, when I was in, first joined the military back in the 70s, is I started using the first word processors, these big eight inch floppy dri drive things. And my boss said, officers are not supposed to use those. Those are for the enlisted people. <laughs> so obviously he wasn't a very um, forward thinking. Uh, so yeah, alarm over rapid change, acting defensively, <laughs> alarm over the unfamiliar, trepidation over use, all of that stuff. Now, what kind of any social, oh, there we go, uh, social behaviors. There, some of the social issues I caught on was, you know, who can you call? Competition, peer pressure, um, saying things online that you wouldn't in present, like we do now, telephone voice, um, all of that. Now, in a later episode, or I'd heard about it, was essentially much like social media today. Uh, they said, we'll forget how to talk face to face if we use the telephone. So, you know, there's lots of different ways and it really hasn't changed over, um, I frankly don't think it's changed over uh, a century as far as our reactions to things. Um, okay, so, who creates technology? I'm going to run through here because I want to get to the technologies, but let's take a look through here. First of all, people have, with money and a reason to do so. So you've got uh, the government, universities, businesses with money who create it. Why? Well, in some cases, why not? In other cases, unfortunately, a lot of our uh, technology has come from war or health situations. You know, right now they're, they're, they're scrambling to try to get a vaccine. Uh, for the uh, uh, virus, um, SARS-2 virus, um, unexpected gain or reputation. Look at us, you know, as far as technology and what we're doing and using and such. New and improved. Okay, yep, yeah. okay. 
So then the other one is who gains from it? Well, hopefully people that um, can use it. Unfortunately, where somebody was talking about the disparities between haves and have-nots earlier. Yep, if you, if you haven't tried the phone can with the tin can and the string, and then the vibration of the wire, uh, that's a really good way to understand what's going on. Um, I'll have to remember that for my telecom class. Yep. Um, I've got, by the way, I, I'm a kind of a, a tech hoarder, and I've got uh, collections of stuff from uh, decades. And so I've got one of the old uh, dial phones from the 40s, and I've got a whole bunch of other stuff all the way up um, through the thing. Okay. So let's also take a look at this then. Uh, who knows Gartner, the Gartner group? Anyone familiar with that? Uh, group or have run or have heard that or okay so in what um, instance yeah yeah uh, exactly okay so they're they're the world's largest as far as I know um, consultant over technology they uh, and a lot of other trends and they uh, track about three thousand. Uh, yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, they track about 3,000 technologies at any given time. Now, all technologies kind of go through this uh, cycle. There's, there's the common production cycle, which you see, yeah, um, this illusion. <laughs> that's kind of, by the way, that's where um, we are, Second Life is, if you want to think of it. We're down in there. Um, up at the very top, it was, 2007 was where it was, uh, virtual worlds were all the rage. And now uh, it's uh, particularly because of the um, uh, recession and all that stuff like that. Uh, but I never understood quite why virtual worlds didn't get further along, except for some of the technology being server um, driven, etc. That's right. But whatever. Uh, these are a couple of the, of the cycles which technology goes through. I'm going to uh, continue uh, so we can get to the technologies themselves. So. The cycles are basically, there's people who are into this stuff all the time. Um, and, well, I think they have a great advantage over Zoom myself. I mean, you could do a lot, and it's more interactive. And so, and faster and stuff. Okay, well, except the lag, okay, but that's part of the problem. Is, uh, and, the, and the propriety. In other words, if you ever got it to where it would work on the web with no lag, you'd, you'd make them money. <laughs> Okay, so first innovators uh, play, they're basically play with it. And then you have these inflated expectations. In other words, oh, virtual worlds. Uh, if you remember back in 2007, 2008, there were business, every business you could possibly imagine was in Second Life looking for new customers, not realizing that, oh, by the way, the new customers are actually real people. Um, <laughs> so, you know, real odd. Uh, look at the thing. Yeah, well, you know, they look like they look like old video games, right? Okay, and the reason being is it's server oriented rather than um, basically console oriented and things. I'm I'm waiting to I'm going to download the big uh, Microsoft Flight Simulator. I'd really like to reproduce some of the early flights across the U.S. and Lindbergh and around the world and over the poles and all that kind of stuff like that. But that's, that's about 100 gigabytes or something. It's really very large, 100 to 200 gigabytes uh, to download. Okay, so um, in any case, you had these overinflated um, uh, expectations. And then for people that actually like us, that although some people are coming back to Second Life, but for people that have remained in it, they, they uh, look at, you know, they, they work out the bugs, look at how it's... Um, uh, where it is useful, uh, that sort of thing. And then it becomes more mainstream, you know. It goes from the whatever happened to, to the it's in the stores. Okay, so that's kind of an introduction to technologies. Now, the actual technologies, I just thought I got these off of that exact graph that I just showed you. There's about eight of them. And a lot of them have to do with extended, what I would call extended communication, but I'm going to start with 5G because it's kind of the key to a lot of it. And then the other parts have to do with machine intelligence. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at then uh, the emerging technologies that um, are out there today, and you might be surprised at what uh, is going on with them. So the first is 5G. 
Now, based on what you see here, what would you say 5G is? What does 5G look like? That's kind of a thing. Big Brother? <laughs> well, no more than anything else. Uh, well, I'm going to talk about why it's called 5G, but um, causes COVID. Yeah, uh, so did telephones, by the way. Uh, telephones caused the 1918 um, pandemic. If you believe that, then you've fallen for um, the propaganda of the day. Okay. Um, so, well, but what do you see in there? What's all the stuff? Well, of course, yeah, and you're absolutely right. Yeah, I, I wouldn't go running out and buy the very first thing when it first comes out. It's going to be full of bugs. Uh, it's not going to have much security. <laughs> ah, there we go. Cass got it. Internet of Things. This is the uh, wireless communication technology that, that connects everything that we want to connect. Uh, it's only Big Brother if we... if. If you think you're important enough for somebody to hack into it, and if um, people do, <laughs> well, <laughs> drills are not, not unless you've got an antenna on a drill, if that's what you're talking about. So let's take a look at what it is. Well, the first thing is, why do we call it 5G? And you have to go back to the late 80s, early 90s. So 1G was essentially, hey, it's a mobile phone. It's this big battery and phone that's in a car. Um, that, um, yeah, I, and I, I, I put want, <laughs> okay, um, <laughs> as careful with words. So it's this big battery and stuff in the car, and the very first actual uh, suitcase phones, that, that's, that's after actually the car ones where it required a huge battery and stuff in the back, the suitcase phones. And the very first ones were actually back in the 70s and then 80s, that sort of thing, 90s. Now, once it went digital, and I think you're talking about the, the, the 90s now, is uh, digital is less noise. Uh, well, that would be that would be 6G, <laughs> the neural implant. Okay, um, we'll, we'll talk about that actually in um, coming up. Okay, I think we're talking. Okay, so 3G was in the early 2000s, where essentially, hey, I can do email, I can see the web. Okay. But you couldn't see videos uh, or, you know, like the Downton Abbey and stuff like that until uh, 4G came along toward the end of the 2000s, toward the end of the 2000s, early 2010s. Uh, and, and the fact that there are smaller and smaller devices and so you actually can have a, G, a, a chip that's implanted in your back of your neck or something. But what is 5G? Okay, da, 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 da. Uh, it's the Internet of Things, but what is that? Okay, let's take a look. Well, let me give you a couple examples because then that will make more sense. One of the things about 5G is it's fast, okay? But that's not the most important part. Uh, we're talking about 20 gigabits per second. So essentially it's like, G. even if you don't have a good connection, um, uh, 5G is uh, like instantaneous type of uh, uh, connections. Um, well, not necessarily the end of stuff, because we still have, I mean, email was invented in the early 70s, and we still have a need for that. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah, connect, well, only if you want to connect your back <laughs> to your phone. In other words, not everything has to be. It's the same way right now. You don't have to have any technology if you don't want, just you wouldn't be hearing this if you didn't. But um, let me give you an example, and, t and you guys can tell me what you Okay, Do, does anyone like traffic lights and uh, speed limits and stuff like that? Anybody not like them? Anybody like sitting in a, a, a traffic light and uh, you like them? <laughs> okay, so any case, well, okay, now that's interesting. Mike says is because essentially what you're at speed limits, I, I love order. I, that way I don't get into an accident. Okay, but let's let's say that your cars, okay, but hang on a second. Let me, let me tell you what 5G can do. Let's say your cars are all connected to each other and same thing with the traffic light uh, or, or whatever it is at an intersection. So what happens is uh, the intersection keeps track of who's coming 
and to word it and at what speed, and it can easily make the calculations for, um, and, you know, and it can easily make the calculations for when somebody will be in the intersection, when they won't. Uh, you could, uh, it could slow the car a little bit down. You don't have to have traffic lights. In other words, essentially, it will allow people through uh, and then uh, without hitting, and it knows exactly all of that sort of stuff like that. Uh, tailgating will be the uh, optimal because the cars are talking to each other. Um, in other words, they're not not looking or, or reading a text message. They're, they're talking to each other. And if somebody's over in the left lane and they need to get off the freeway, then all the cars will be uh, cooperate and let them get off. And uh, you can go, you know, 80 miles an hour close to each other and all this stuff like that. Um, so traffic lights will be a thing of the past because it's really because the intersections will communicate with the cars and everybody will be able to do it safely. Okay, so that's one of the um, examples of how this can work. The, but the most important part about 5G is the immediate response. In other words, the split-second decisions, you can't have a lag if you're trying to get through an intersection and with split-second timing, okay? Um, well, you know, you could always say that the telephone does that too. You know, in other words, you can get paranoid. Frankly, uh, one of the tricks to not being paranoid is to realize that no one cares. You're just some. You're just one little bug in the middle of uh, you know everything, and no one really cares. <laughs> you know, uh, so you know, get over yourself. Um, okay, so. Well, there, there may be also uh, health monitors and stuff, so that if you're having a problem, your car can go, uh, your heart rate's rather high, uh, you know, can I, you know, all that stuff like that. Um, or I said, you know, that kind of, with the steering wheel. Okay, so if you look at other things like smart, smart appliances, like a refrigerator, Okay, refrigerator can go, oh, I see that you have blah, 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 blah. Here's some recipes for how to, vital signs, uh, all that. Okay, uh, now, so uh, here's ingredients that you have. Uh, here's some recipes for it. Oh, by the way, here's a recipe, and have you thought about this alternative in, in place of this? Uh, what about nutrition? So what if you know you need a, a low sodium diet or whatever? Uh, can I order this for you? I see you're, you're low on on milk or, or something. Can I order it for you? Um, 5G helps make this uh, stuff possible, but you're not only talking about refrigerators, uh, you're talking about lights. Why have a light on when you don't need it? In other words, you walk into a room, the light goes off. You walk out, the light goes off. Uh, has two cameras. Well, I have a, yeah, now I have one in back. I don't have one that tracks the closest, but of course that's next. In other words, we're slowly moving toward, by the way, one of the technologies uh, that I will talk about is autonomous uh, vehicles. So hang on for a second on that. But what about doors and windows and internal and external lawn and plants and stuff? It's like, <coughs> I'm thirsty, says your little plant. You know, uh, you, can, you can go as far as you want on this stuff. Um, but not just houses, of course, but everything. An inventory with intelligence on it and suggestions, um, habit things and communications and all this stuff. That doesn't mean you have to. Well, it can if you want it to. Remember, this isn't somebody controlling your life. This is someone helping you to live better, okay? Um, yeah, your door, so hi. Hi, welcome home. Go away. <laughs> You know, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> no. um, you know, uh, whatever your house. Uh, you, 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 hey, I'd like to control the voice on, say, the door, and the door greets me in some thing like, hi, idiot, how's your day? You know, <laughs> no, only depending on what the uh, um, <laughs> mood I was in, right? Okay. Uh, now, of course, there's the big one here. There is artificial intelligence. Yeah, telling you to take out the trash. Um, of course, I'd, I'd, I'd like to have an artificial intelligence thing helping take out the trash, but, you know. Um, yeah, it's not so much, it's uh, like social media, so we're already, we're already 
levying things, so to speak, manipulators. Uh, so it's just one. Well, yeah, okay, so let's take a look at this. Artificial intelligence is a very interesting one. Um, well, what, what I get concerned with is, is like Alexa coming on and going, oh, I don't, you know, I didn't know that or, or, or some other thing like that. By the way, is Alexa a male voice in the UK or, or uh, Siri or one of those I think is a, is a male voice in the UK? Somebody might want to verify that. Um, yeah. Okay, so in artificial intelligence, um, yeah, uh, yeah, we get, we have those. But what what concerns me is when I'm talking to my wife or something, and I'll say something, and Siri will come in and go, "Oh, uh, that's you know, blah 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 blah." And we we both go, "Shut up! We weren't talking to you." Okay. So, in any case, um, now let's take a look then at what artificial intelligence normally is. Um, is that in the old days, uh, artificial intelligence basically was these things here. In other words. Here's some choices you decide. In other words, why do people get paid? Uh, maybe tagline can. Whoops. Um, no, you've you've given stuff. So I, it's it's not a surprise to say that you're a doctor. Okay. So, but why do doctors study a lot and get paid a lot? Uh, because they have to know a lot and be able to make decisions and be able to distinguish things uh, from others and and all of that stuff and keep up on information. I mean, it's it's quite a uh, uh, a, a task, and that's only part of it, of course. But in a decision support system, you're essentially um, the computer is helping you to see, okay, these are all the different decisions you can make, and uh, so you decide. Now, in an expert system, um, basically, it's saying this is how an expert would think about this. So the computer then actually acts as if it's an expert in that area. Um, neural networks then are a way for computers to connect where it's more like a brain rather than a flat piece of uh, machinery like you have in, in computers and such like that, the way they do now. Okay, so, um, Let's take a look then at where we're going with artificial intelligence. One is artificial intelligence should help you to, basically gives your brain some assistance, okay? Um, so how may a machine help? In other words, what's a machine do that a, computer, that a human can't? And one is it can do faster searches. So if you're, you, I mean, that's what you look at Google, and Google is a uh, entire farm of just thousands of uh, uh, servers and stuff all uh, working together, and they can easily come up with a billion responses in a fraction of a second. Okay, so faster search is more accuracy, um, and then more memory. So let's look at exactly who's heard of Watson. Any, anyone heard of the, uh, IBM Watson? Yeah, okay, so how did you hear of it? Have you used it or have you heard of it? Jeopardy. <laughs> okay, yeah, that was quite a step back about, what, nine years ago or something? Um, uh, where, it, where it basically beat, um, it can be used as a teacher's aid, absolutely. It can be used, well, chess, they, it, it can chess, but chess would be easy because, uh, you know, IBM Big Blue actually beat the world's champion in chess back in 95, I think. Uh, and then lately, though, they uh, one of the um, uh, computers beat people in the game of Go, which is much, much more difficult. But let's take a look at what Watson actually does. If you actually look at what it does inside, um, yep, neural networks are set up to learn, so basically, uh, and, and got a lot of good stuff going on there in, in chat. Um, well, they learn from their experiences, not just humans. I mean, they can learn from ex humans. Humans can then evaluate what they're learning and input there, but it's kind of a cycle type sort of thing. And, and then humans can see how they're learning and, and such. Okay, so in any case, what Watson does is the first thing it does is what you're doing right now. It translates from what, I'm, what you're hearing to your own language. And so in case of computer, it has to translate to machine language. 
it has a search engine to go, oh, uh, they just said this. Let's go look up everything there is possibly to know about this. Uh, it's got a huge uh, memory and data sources that it could look up. It's And then it goes, okay, they just, like in Jeopardy, it can look at a clue, and it goes, well, what if I say, hey, what could that mean in context? Is it... Is it, hey, is it, hey, is it, um, let's say, I don't know how many other hey's, but whatever. In other words, which of those are the correct uh, context? Hey, yeah, that kind of stuff. So, um, hey, you know, in other words, those are all different contexts for the same word, but what uh, a, a machine like Watson can do is look at uh, all of the historic contexts, all of everything else that's involving, and then come up with a candidate evaluation and then basically go, okay, if I were an expert, how would I handle this? So it's a very fascinating uh, machine. But remember, it is a machine. And so where could we use Watson? You're talking about teaching. Uh, you could use it um, in one's... Uh, yep, now the, the bias there, when you're talking about bias, whether it's bias against women, bias my minorities, um, it's because of programming. In other words, who are the programmers? So that's, of course, another good reason to have programmers and users and testers and stuff who look like the world rather than just uh, part of it, okay? So in any case, healthcare, legal professionals make decisions based on evidence, uh, complex systems, hurricanes, climate change, um, financial trends and futures, and then, of course, controlling and predicting many, many variables along the way. So that's kind of where artificial intelligence can help. Uh, okay, that's one of the, that's that's one thing. It can also, of course, use evidence to help find criminals. Now, another one, technology here, is um, 3D printing. And 3D printing can be like what you see on front here. In other words, it can print um, complex objects to see what they look like, like for example, if you're, or, and then use them as a hologram sort of thing to be able to, uh, like for surgery and such. Um, but let's take a look at 3D printing and some of the types of ways it's used. Um, one of the first ways it's used is what's called rapid prototyping. In other words, it, just like uh, you do mesh here in Second Life. If you use um, some sort of a 3D blender or other types of uh, software, um, then you can then render it as an object so that instead of having to draw that object, you can show people. Because in the old days, you used to have to draw 3D. In fact, I taught a class back nearly 20 years ago um, on um, a 3D drawing class for engineering. Yeah, 3D printers are, are cool. Now, 3D printers can be like the one up there where you see the little orange thing here. Um, that's just a quick rendering in plastic. But you can render things in actual human-compatible substances. So, for example, you uh, human organs. One of the first ones was an ear, because that's basically cartilage, uh, that sort of thing. And so uh, let's take a look then at the house, okay? Now, what I'm going to give you is I'm going to give you another... Uh, video which I'd like you to go take a look at real quick and this is about three minutes you don't have to do the whole thing but this is about three minutes and it just gives you an idea of what you can do um,
Oh, I'm sorry. I'm listening to the video. If you can take a look at the video, and then I'll come back. Okay, so essentially you get the idea. You don't have to necessarily do the whole thing. Uh, so they're going to try to do it in different uh, places. Um, now, uh, by the way, uh, for some, somebody who said, where's the electricity and plumbing and stuff go? Is that um, homes have them in the walls, but uh, ships don't. In other words, there's, no, there's nothing that says you have to have uh, it in the walls. Um, all of the piping, all of the you know, electrical lines and stuff like that, are outside uh, the walls. And of course, there is a space there for insulation and things. Okay, that, that particular company, uh, well, solar, of course, would make great on the roof. And so that that's, takes care of stuff like that. Um, okay, so the idea, so there's a lot, but I'm glad that, that you, uh, decorative plumbing, plumbing is art, absolutely, why not? Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at some of these other ones. I'm, I'm just watching my time a little bit. Is that besides printing, uh, plastic or um, concrete or whatever is that uh, there are lots of different substances that you can use. Uh, NASA is using uh, printed food. Uh, actually, you can go on YouTube and see a printed taco, for example. <laughs> Which, or in this case, uh, there's a video on a printed pizza for uh, astronauts. Uh, now, th what's very fascinating about this is what does it do? It means and this, this is, if you, if you get nothing from this other than this, what the most important thing about this is you don't have to take it with you. All you have to do is take a set of plans and then take a, a, D, a 3D printer. In fact, actually, a, a 3D printer could build a 3D printer. Um, is essentially, uh, you just have to have a printer that can handle different materials so that it can then make a home like on Mars or the moon that actually adapts to the uh, location and all of that sort of thing. So that, that's what uh, this really would be helpful for uh, space travelers and stuff. Um, yeah, absolutely. Sure, why not? Plus you, can, uh, yeah, plus you can make anything you can dream of, just like in Second Life. Okay. The other thing about 3D printing, and this is very interesting, and I don't, darn it, I don't uh, have the, um, um, the video, excuse me, the link on this, but uh, this is really exciting in my field, is that essentially computer chips have been created in essentially the same way using something called photomicrolithography since the 1970s. And it has allowed chips to get smaller and smaller and smaller because actually the transistors are smaller and smaller. But it all, there's also a limit to it. So essentially since around 2000, um, the limit has been, uh, so in other words, computers have gotten 
they haven't gotten faster necessarily since 2000, early 2000s. Uh, what they have is they've had multiple cores, which then allow them to um, work with each other and, and so-called think better, much like a, a, a AI. Yeah, and then AI, and then of course quantum computing and stuff like that. Uh, but uh, using 3D printing, there is now nanoscale, meaning billions of a meter scale. Uh, and there's a great video, and I don't have it here, I'll have to catch it. Uh, but it can do a thousand times faster than currently and um, uh, much better than we can do right now. It's a, it's a great leap ahead. Okay, now, how about this one? Brain control interface. Who knows about this one? <laughs> yeah, the Borg. <laughs> well, uh, here again, it, it 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 depends on whether you want it to be the Borg or the Matrix or whatever. Although, remember, the Matrix is essentially what we're doing right here, Second Life, right? I mean, is this real or is this... <laughs> um, once, you, once you connect them... Whoops. Okay, my phone was going to do something. Okay, so in any case... Um, Let's take a look at this. Here's a quick video. It's only two minutes, and you don't have to do the whole thing. It's about two and a half minutes. And what I'd like to show you is some early stuff is about can, even a monkey can control things. Sorry, monkeys. I don't want to disparage you. Uh, monkeys are great. Okay, but a monkey's brain can control objects, and people's brain can too. So take a look at that. Watch this. Go ahead and watch this video here and see what you think about this. This is, this is actually old. Some of this technology was from a little while back. Okay, so uh, hopefully you're um, finished with that one. Um, this was in 2008, so it was a while back, and actually since then, in Japan, if you've heard of exoskeletons, in Japan, they made an exoskeleton that allowed people to, um, <laughs> well, you know, um, 
Yeah, they have made uh, an exoskeleton that allowed people who were paraplegic to actually be able to walk. Now here, by the way, you're talking about the chip. Hey, it's here. <laughs> this is uh, here again. You can uh, you can take a look at some of the. Um, I put the YouTube video links on here, but um, due to time, I don't want to show all of the videos. So uh, if this is being video, if this is being video, then you can take a look at the or look these up. In other words, uh, this is Elon Musk, and um, we can understand how the brain de uh, uh, does these things. And so essentially, what you're seeing there, and this is on a TED talk, and what you're seeing there is Elon Musk. That's a surgical unit that attaches a chip inside your brain mechanically with that surgical unit. So current tests are under, underway for human tests uh, to do this. So, you know, the future is here in some of these cases, uh, the Neuralink, okay? Um, now, what in being serious, one of the things in, uh, that you can do then is basically, like I said, is that first of all, if you're paraplegic or, or whatever, you could use a, a suit to enhance, or yeah, like a cochlear implant, essentially, you can enhance your movement. Uh, even if you can't move your arms or legs, uh, you could do that. Uh, astronauts, military, physical labor. In other words, how about being able to lift 200 pounds anywhere you want with no effort, that kind of stuff. Uh, it's not limited to computers. Um, for some period of time, of course, people have been able to uh, control wheelchairs, they've been able to um, interface with computer, all of that sort of stuff. So this is uh, a serious thing that is used for um, uh, people and here, like every technology we've shown, it's a way to extend uh, what we um, naturally do or, or can't. Uh, anymore. Uh, as you know, by the way, and this is kind of a lead into immersive uh, spaces as the next technology, is you may be aware that there are a number of people in Second Life who use Second Life to lead a um, normal life of communication who may be in a wheelchair or otherwise mobily impaired. Uh, and there's other people that uh, use Second Life for lots of other uh, purposes. And so we already know that uh, immersive, immersive spaces can do that. Now, immersive spaces can be used uh, in business. In other words, down at the bottom there, essentially you've got a squad of military people using a, a simulation. Uh, it can be for collaborative work purposes like uh, a, a nuclear reaction simulation. Um, like is depicted up on the top. And then of course we all know about, but very few people perhaps out of Second Life know about um, the uses of Second Life, where you can control your identity, uh, where you can be in imaginative worlds uh, that may be very real looking or may be completely imaginative. And so it's only left to your brain as to what your actual world looks and sounds and feels like and such, uh, which we're all doing right now for collaborative social purposes. I mean, I really know of no other technology right now that compares to this for a collaborative social purpose, international type collaborative social purpose. I think it's rather phenomenal. Um, now, speaking of which, of course, now we get one step further here where we've got augmented and uh, virtual reality and um, so let's take a look at that and, and those technologies and what we do. Now, some of the earlier, well, that's, that's our choice. In other words, we don't, like I said, technology is what we weren't born with. If you choose to use it, you choose to learn, you should learn about it and use it wisely and responsibly and socially constructively and also know about what, how people can use it otherwise. As I like to tell my students, uh, fire can be used to uh, cook, it can be used to light, uh, it can be used to sterilize, you know, food. Uh, it can also be used to burn down a house with someone in it. So, you know, uh, it all depends on uh, our 
uh, collaborating to uh, use technology in socially constructive ways. Okay, so augmented and virtual reality. Let's take a look then at um, virtual reality. Some of the easiest, uh, aug excuse me, augmented reality is essentially where you're either, either because it recognizes an image or geolocation or a little IR blip or whatever, you can put it over an object and then it will give you information. Like for example, the painter and then information about them, maybe a little video that you can watch to enhance your learning. It may put together a 2D blueprint into a 3D image. Uh, so you can visualize uh, things like that. Um, if you look then at virtual reality, essentially now you've got, instead of a screen, you've got a 360 in all directions. So now that you're, now you're within it, um, much like using VR in, in Second Life. And so um, that is a HoloLens up there. We have a class in virtual reality at the university and uh, a, um, someone who really knows what they're doing on this. And so uh, our students get to um, take a yeah, full pie. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's see. Wow, that's a big. Okay. Tron Lawnmower Man. Okay, but let's take a look then at uh, the last, I think this is the last technology, we've got two minutes to the hour, is autonomous uh, transport. And let's look at uh, some of the types of uh, things associated with that. One is a varying degree of control. In other words, by using speed uh, cruise control or uh, backing up and stuff like that, or even brake control, you know, automatic braking sort of thing, um, we're slowly in letting the car enable us to uh, use it better. And so you can augment certain types of tasks, like say, for example, um, uh, driving on a boring freeway somewhere, and then you can take over if you want to in town, uh, those sorts of things. So personal systems kind of give you more time to do stuff. Right now you could be watching Second Life while driving, okay? You could be reading or taking a nap, or in other words, you could use, be using that time more productively than just driving down a road, unless, of course, you like driving down a road, okay? And you can drive longer. There's no reason why someone who does have diminished physical or mental debil uh, the abilities cannot drive, so you're giving people a lot more um, freedom to do that. Now, public systems, I want to ask, I, I'm going to go over it slightly, not too long, uh, but I'm going to go over slightly uh, past the hour. Um, but I want to ask, which one of these would you be most, because I've got robotics coming up, which of these would you be most comfortable doing? Uh, a large truck, a train, or an airplane being autonomous? By the way, I hate to tell you, but a lot of airplanes today are almost completely autonomous. Well, yes, there is the hacking thing. There's always a hacking thing. Or kidnap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, we're very paranoid people today. Trains, of course, yeah, because they have a track. Um, we are electric bikes, sensors. You know, if you're in Singapore, they already have um, auto, auto, autonomous taxis. None of the above. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, well, you know, uh, you don't have... Second Life could be hacked, too. <laughs> I, I suppose you're, you know, almost anything you have today can be, um, if you really think you're so special that people should hack you. Um, that's kind of the way I looked at it. So in any case, um, so, so public systems, in other words, planned routes, higher productivity. For example, in an in 18-wheeler a trucks, uh, people can't drive for more than 10 hours legally without getting some sleep. Well, an autonomous truck could care less. They can drive 24 hours, so as far so basically you double the productivity. Um, some riders are hacks. Well, I agree with that too. Okay, so robotics. Now, my last technology is robotics, and so let's take a look at some of the. Uh, yeah, and they probably will. Okay, so now um, robotics can be used in areas that are basically make it safer for humans. So, for example, drones can go to places that are dangerous. 
uh, robots, if you recognize the one down on the bottom, that's a, a, a um, IED uh, searching robot um, for the military. Um, but they can also do regular types of uh, things. Now, I do have one more robot here, which I'd really like to show you because uh, it's fascinating. I think you'll get a, a real kick out of this one. And it has to do with, um, let's see, where's my little, um, okay, go to, uh, go to this one here. I'm going to give you a, a quick video on here. Um, this is another short video. In fact, actually, this one's not very long at all. But go to here because it's the little robot that you see on the right. It's really quite fascinating. I think you're going to have a good I'm going to have fun do it, watching this one here real quick. Here again, it's only a couple minutes. In fact, it's uh, 1 minute and 30 seconds. Well, yeah, and it, I, I guess uh, we're done with the video there. Um, I thought it was pretty cute. There's a lot of different uh, types of robots, but it kind of gives a... Well, they can if they have their program. <laughs> you know, anything with a gun can kill, or a bomb, or whatever. Um, yeah, there you go. Okay, so, well, not only that, but... Um, you can have, what, re a robot uh, flying reindeer and Santa can be replaced too, huh? Okay. Uh, so, in any case, uh, what I have up here is a couple examples. Of course, uh, industrial robots have been around for a while, uh, particularly in the 80s uh, in, in Japan. Roomba, I have a Roomba. They're kind of fun. Um, and then autonomous tractors that uh, both sow and also harvest. And so uh, these are ones which work uh, for you, uh, ones, and so in addition to that, though, we're, we can look at robots in the future. Somebody mentioned uh, space exploration, and so um, there's that, and, and then, of course, not only semi-autonomous robots, but then robot assistants that can help us um, with, say, space missions, doing the uh, dangerous work, stuff like that. Of course, we did talk about ethics, right, in science a while, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I think, uh, for a panel. And so you're going to have to then think about the ethics of robots. Um, I, well, I'm certain there's robots in the sense that there's robot arms and stuff like that, okay, like what Syzygy was saying. So you're going to have to talk about the – so sooner or later, as you get a combination of AI – and robots. Somebody was mentioning that they get somebody got upset when somebody shot a, one of the Boston Dynamics uh, robots because it becomes more um, thing and so, and now uh, becomes more we 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 identify with it. Which, by the way, hang on just a second. Uh, that's coming up in here another slide. But essentially, robots can assist us with work environments. Like right now, think about it with the coronavirus. Uh, a robot can then help 
handle samples, uh, forms, uh, do things where people don't have to get near other people. Um, so robots can come in handy. Uh, disaster cleanup, research work, absolutely. Um, underwater, um, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, well, I don't know that somebody did, but somebody mentioned it. Um, and caring for the elderly, absolutely. In fact, actually, that brings us to kind of the last slide here, is that uh, for the technologies. And that is, there is this concept of the uncanny valley. In other words, a robot on the right, robots can look like whatever they want, yes? Uh, you're right, and uh, I had read long ago that essentially that's going to be a big industry coming up this, isn't it? Um, but you've got the robot on the right, which then appears to be compassionate. We anthropomorphize them, absolutely. And so it appears to be more compassionate, or at least not threatening. Whereas what about the one on the, on the left? Which one of those looks kind of creepiest to you? Which, which is the ones that, do you trust the one on the, the, the left <laughs> or the right? You know, and we can make our robots look any, any way we want. Yeah, the, the two human one, two human meaning the uncanny of Allen effect, absolutely, which I've caught up there. It's where they're too close because they, you know they're not human, so they begin to look creepy at a certain point when they look too human. Okay, so those are the eight technologies today, and I'm going to make some conclusions here and see if you have other conclusions to um, um, add, is essentially, one is, remember the technology kind of extends what we already do, and the new technology is just new to whoever doesn't, hasn't done it yet. Um, tools by themselves are just tools. It's the programmers or users who can use them for socially constructive or socially uh, destructive manners. They can be used to change their lives, but they can also change the job market. Uh, they can be scary to people. They can be abused. Uh, they're most likely inevitable. Um, and they're less scary when they're understood, which is why I have uh, shared this with you today. Okay? So uh, thank you. Enjoy. We've got lots of good stuff coming up. Take a look at the next uh, weeks. And this may be filmed. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. If you're ever interested in where I got some of the information, I've got plenty of. Um, uh, references and stuff for them too, so just let me know. Okay, otherwise, uh, take care, have fun, enjoy life. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I'm saying nice things about robots, that way they won't go. <laughs> Grace, gracias. Okay. Have fun. You know, I don't, um, I don't buy all the technology things being causing cancer and doing, you know, <laughs> that's just, to me, all scare tactics for people that don't know anything about technology. Uh, for Shiloh and other people asking about um, some of the slides and things, um, I'm pretty sure if it's being recorded, we'll have either the 
PDF or the video or something up online. And if you want a copy, just let me know and I'll see what I can do or, or send you an email address or something. Well, five, you know, we use 3G, 4G right now, so 5G, um, you know, as far as computers, obviously, what's the impact on the environment? It's all the little parts on the computers and throwing the computers away. <laughs> and the amount of electricity you use by computers. That's as far as it. Oh, good. I'm glad some of them were. <laughs> So I don't, I don't see that 5G is any more scarier than any other G. It's just going to have a lot more um, uses. It's the next evolution. Okay. Have fun. I think I'm going to wander off to, let's see, how will they fit into society? Well, you know that's a problem is uh, with the, the more technology and the more detailed and sophisticated and stuff, in some cases, the more expensive and the more it's going to be difficult for the have-nots to have access unless there are people like, frankly, the, uh, you know, Bill Gates, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates, who uh, are, um, help subsidize some of the uh, technologies and medicines and stuff. Okay. Okay. I'm going to cut it off. Thank you. Take care. Namaste.